Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends and I have here with me today, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh. And hello, <laughs> Koneko. Yes, it is a big surprise. <gasps> they went to the horsies earlier today. Vacation and super hot. It's really fucking hot here too. Merge lessons morning and afternoon. So I'm here today. Oh my God, I'm so glad. And you're here. You're here for like a, an amazing stream. But before we actually talk about that, oh, and, and hello to Lunar. I saw that Hal. So welcome, welcome in. Um, before we do that, uh, Landon, you have a different background. Oh my gosh, what's going on? We're playing a game of where in the world is Landon. Landon's on vacation and, uh, you know, Mocking Jay waits for nobody. We're going to mm -hmm. be a little gritty, a little on the run here, uh, much like the books. <laughs> yes. So, and so, um, Landon's got vacation audio set up. Uh, my voice is still a little bit scratchy from being sick, as you guys know, um, that followed my Twitter and, and are in the Discord. So, you know, appropriate for our conversation today, which, yes, as Landon said, is about Mocking Jay, right? So, what all? What all are we going to talk about today, Landon? Oh my gosh, Mocking Jay! What We're going to talk about Viva La Revolution. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about fascism. We're going to talk about the evolution of our boy Gale. Mm -hmm. uh, we got some. We got some really cool things up in this mm -hmm. section. So it'll be a fun little talk. Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, I can't wait. I, I love the Mocking Jay. Um, really quick, I want to explain the packages behind me. My birthday is on 22nd, you guys. My birthday is on the 22nd. And um, during the stream, since that's actually a Saturday, during that stream, I am going to open birthday gifts. Most of these are from you guys back here. If you want to contribute and be a part of that, then you can get something on the throne. You can also suggest stuff there. If you don't like any of the stuff there or it's like you want to do something cheap, all that's fine. Be happy to approve whatever you guys put on there. And we'll open those up on uh, on that stream, probably around 2 p.m. ish or so. So yeah, that's what that is. Um, but with that being said, I would love to just get into it because like I really want to talk about the mocking day. Oh my gosh, you guys, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Yes. Oh, and yeah. And after my stream, we're going to go on the 22nd, we're going to uh, go and raid into Lunar Stream, who's going to uh, stream FNAF for us since I'm too much of a weenie to play it myself. But I do really enjoy watching that game. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Here we go. The Mockingjay, boop. This is our, our beautiful presentation, Mockingjay, Viva La Revolution. Um, and, and yeah, third book. Oh my gosh, third book of the trilogy. Uh, but it's only halfway through the year. So there are going to be plenty more Hunger Games episodes. This is not the last one. So I don't want you guys to panic and be like, oh no, Hunger Games over. Hunger Games is not over, you guys. There's going to be at least three more Hunger Games episodes before the end of the year. But this is the ending of the trilogy. So um, so it's quite an interesting have, to have it as a middle episode, isn't it? It is. Uh, but it, it is it's such a good one, too. I love this book so much. And it, it really does round out uh, the whole trilogy really, really well. Uh, so let's get started into it. Yes, let's go. First and foremost, we start with our favorite things. So, Karen, what was your favorite thing? My favorite thing is the kitty cat. Oh, my God. The kitty cat, such a minor, silly little character um, in the first two books, actually has, like, some very interesting things happen in this book. And you guys know I love kitty cats, and so I love the kitty cat. And so in this book, if you guys do not remember, basically what happens is they convince um, District 13 that Prim does need to have her cat. Okay, Prim does need to have her cat and make Katniss happy and they want to make Katniss happy. So they let Prim have her cat and there is a scene where um, where they all have to evacuate down to a lower level of the bunker that they all live in and um, because they can't find the cat at first, Prim and Gail almost get locked out, but the last minute they save the kitty. They save the kitty. They get inside. Everybody's fine. Okay. And the cat actually becomes like really important to Katniss because at the end, and we'll, we'll do a summary of this. And this is not a spoiler free podcast, by the way. Here's your warning. Not a spoiler free podcast. Um, you turn off now because we're about, I'm about to big, big spoiler. Um, the cat is really, really helpful for Katniss as kind of like the last thing that she still has of Prim when uh, Prim does not make it to the end of the book. So I think that cat is very important. It's, it's like it's the true 
enemies to best friends trope, Katniss and the cat, okay? And I just love it. Emotional, superb (laughs) kitty. That's right, Koneko, you got it. I love the kitty cat. The cat is like Katniss's symbol of survival. Like, it Mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. much represents survival in this book by any means because the cat survives the bombings and it survives the war and all of that. Uh, And then it, it, it gives that comfort to Katniss at the end Mm -hmm. so definitely a nice little symbolism of survival in there and I like to imagine that the cat uh lives all the way until she and Peta start having kids so like I I like to imagine that the cat's there for her like the whole time (laughs) yeah I do too I like to imagine that it's like just the cat that's always there Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure so that's my favorite thing in this book every time the cat shows up I'm like yeah kitty cat time um, and it gets like three or four scenes in this book, which is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so love it. Um, so that's my favorite thing. Landon, what is your favorite thing from Mockingjay? All right. We love a little depressed moment. And the real or not real game that Katniss and Peta play for me is the epitome of angsty romance. Uh for we'll we'll discuss it a little bit in the summary, but to clue you in, in case you don't know what we're talking about, Peta undergoes a uh, severe trauma and can't tell the difference between uh, brainwashing and reality. And as a way to kind of keep him grounded and human, uh, Katniss and him play this fun little game where they will go through facts and things that Peta are thinking, uh, and Peta will ask real or not real. And Katniss will answer if it's real or not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just love that this is kind of that, uh, it, it is the softest, softest I think we ever see Katniss be, mm-hmm. is willing to play this game because it's like a vulnerable thing. Yeah. And, you know, when you have something that can just gut punch you and that's like subtle enough to make you like see the consequences of trauma and the consequences of of actions that happened and the impact and it connects a character in a way. I love it. I love it. It's so good because everyone kind of gets in on in on this game mm-hmm. with PETA. So it allows an opportunity for everyone to bond with PETA, the people that that knew him and the people that didn't. It lets us see for the people that did know him how some of those relationships are because this book is from Katniss's perspective. Like we know that Gail and PETA know each other, for example, but we really do not know anything about what kind of relationship they have, if one at all. And um, and because PETA needs so much support and they're able to find doing that support through this game. Uh, It allows us to see like everyone's relationship with PETA, um, which is really nice. Another point in the favor of like, I want to read Hunger Games from PETA's perspective, like truly, like because this would be so interesting, I think, to get in his head for this part. Well, just in, in all the thoughts that he is struggling with and all the things that like he goes through and is tortured through and and, and the truths that are twisted in such a in such a terrible way. Uh, I think that this book through Peta's eyes is a very, very different book mm-hmm. than Katniss. I, I think that like almost Katniss and Peta go on opposite journeys where uh Katniss's story goes from like survival to themselves to survival of like the the everybody Mm. like the war survival and for Peta it's almost like survival for this other person for the star for this thing and then goes to like I need to survive myself oh and it's it's like this this mirroring opposite sort of thing and catching fire is where they are the most in touch with each other except for the end where they're most in touch with each other and that's kind of where they're meeting in the middle Mm -hmm. uh and so we just see a very different pita this this book yeah yeah for real for him it's the realization that if he's not protecting himself he can't actually help others yeah where katniss is having having the opposite realization like it ain't all about you girl yeah the yeah that you have to stand up for you've been given this opportunity to be the voice of mm-hmm. of everybody and that you need to take advantage because no one else will do it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yep so that was our favorite things um for this particular book 
Um, so yeah, let's kind of get into it. Let's go ahead and get into it. So before we get started, we always like to do a summary for those that have not read the book in quite some time or have never read the book. By the way, if you've never read the Hunger Games books, I highly recommend them, even with all the spoilers that we're going to give. It's still good. It's still a good ride. So to make sure that we are all up to date, um, Landon is going to summarize the events of Mockingjay for us. So Katniss Everdeen awakes to discover that she has become a pawn in somebody else's game. Her home, District 12, has been obliterated by the Capitol, and she now lives in District 13 as they organize a force for rebellion. Katniss must now serve as the face of this rebellion, their Mockingjay, or forfeit the lives of the people around her that she loves. Uh, she leverages her power over the uh, the rebellion's leader, Alma Coyne, to her advantage, gaining a few uh, caveats to her willingness to work, uh, including that her sister gets to keep a cat and that when Snow is eventually murdered uh, and executed, that she will be the person who is willing to do it. Uh, she soon discovers that her efforts will cost her dearly. Uh, and, of course, she demands that PETA has to be saved from the capital where he is being held captive. By the time Pita is rescued from the capital, his memories have been twisted so violently that he is a threat to Katniss's life. Katniss finds purpose in her role as the Mockingjay, but she chafes under the scrutiny of the control of Coin, former game maker Poltar Kevinsby, and her mentor, mentor Haymitch. Uh, Katniss seeks comfort in her friend Gail, but is troubled by his enthusiastic enthusiasm of the war that is happening and how he works with BD to create new death traps for their enemies. Katniss's affections are divided between Peta and Gail, but she knows that one day she'll have to choose one of them or risk losing them both, possibly to death. She asks to be sent into action in hopes that she could be more useful to the rebels as just a symbol. Katniss watches in horror as Gale's tactics are used on Capitol so soldiers in District 2, and she is wounded while trying to reason with one of the survivors. Katniss returns to District 13 and recovers to recover and develops a surprising bond with old, uh, Cap uh, with old uh, enemy Joanna. Uh, the two train together, readying themselves for combat. Katniss is assigned to a, an assault squad along with Gale, Finnick, and several others under the command of Boggs, who is a squad captain who, that will not see much action in the capital. Uh, they are now, which is now rigged with these deadly booby traps uh, called pods. And instead of actually fighting, their task becomes to film tropos under the direction of Credessa to boost the morale of the rebels uh, as they move close into President so Snow's mansion. When the member of the squad is of their squad is killed, Coin sends in Peta to join Boggs' squad in the capital. And Boggs and Katniss both recognize this as a threat to Katniss's life. And Boggs warns Katniss not to trust Coin, but sh that she is willing to do anything, including kill Katniss, to get what she wants. The squad moves forward. Bog guides their moves using a ho the hollow. Before long, several members of the squad, including Boggs, are killed. Before he die dies, Boggs reassigns the hollow to Katniss, giving her command over the remaining squad members. Concealing her true plan, which is to assassinate President Snow, Katniss leads the group underground. Peta is triggered by all the chaos and carnage caused by the pods and begs Katniss to kill him. And instead, the squad works to help him distinguish what is real from what is what they what is planted in his mind by the capital. Though there are fewer pods underground, there are, they uh, are attacked by a pack of capital created mutants, and more members of the squads are killed before the rest of them reach the surface. Katniss has to use the self destruct feature in the Hollow to give Finnick a quick death instead of an agonizing one of being ripped apart. She leads Gale, Peteness, and what remains of the crew to the streets of the capital. Peta insists that it's too much he is too much of a danger to Katniss, so the group splits up. Katniss and Gale hide amongst the capital refugees, seeking shelter in Snow's mansion. Shooting and chaos fractures the crowd. Peacemakers form a barrier around the mansion using capital children as shields. Katniss watches in horror of hovercrafts 
crafts drop bombs on the children and then drops another bomb on the aid workers, killing many of the children and Katniss's sister Primrose. Katniss herself is badly injured and she falls unconscious before recognizing that Gail came up with this idea. Uh, from the conversation with Snow, who was imprisoned and weakened by a fatal illness, Katniss learns that the bomb that killed her sister was not dropped by him, but rather the new president, Coyne. Coyne proposes that under her regime, the Hunger Games should still exist, but tributes will now come from the capital instead of the districts. Peta, Bede, and Annie vote against the re reinstating the games while others are in favor. Katniss and Hamish vote only to gain Coyne's trust. Uh, Katniss follows Coyne to Snow's execution, and the new president has kept her promise that Katniss is the one to execute him. But in the final moment, uh, her bow is not aimed at Snow, but rather at Coyne. The new president dies instantly, and Katniss is arrested. Uh, after a few days in trial, Hamish comes to take Katniss home. Uh, Pan Am is under new leadership with Coin and Snow both dead. And the victors are finally free to live their lives in the house of the victor circle. Peta soon joins them and the three begin to heal together. Katniss and Peta find love with each other once again and the new peace and the knowledge that their children will never have to know the nightmares of the Hunger Games. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so good. It's just so good. <laughs> it's so good. And I, I know- A lot freaking happens in this book. <laughs> Yep. And I know that like, it's possible when depending on your age, when you were reading this as a kid, this might have been the book where you were like, mm, what, what? I urge you if this was your reaction to Mockingjay when it came out to reread it as an adult. It is so good. Um, you know, just because it's not centered around like a games the way the first two books were, there is still so much action in here that's politically motivated that's going to resonate with you a lot more as an adult than it did as a child. Well, I think that the the important thing is the shift we see. Like the mm -hmm. Hunger Games book is about the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. Then we have Catching Fire, which kind of splits the political games that people play in government and the Hunger Games. And this is fully about the politics and the games that are played in a world of war. So whether that be like the games that Coin are playing by using people literally as chess pieces, whether that be the games that they have to play with uh, PETA in order to get him to like move forward. Uh, the, the politic games exist in here. And as a teenager, it's a little hard to like get into that, but it is so, so well done and so accurate uh, to what I think would really happen in this mm -hmm. kind of world that it feels so real. Yes, for sure. I totally agree. Now, we're going to talk all about District 13. We're going to talk about President Coyne. We're going to talk about Katniss actually gaining some political thoughts in this book that she doesn't really have in mm -hmm. the other two. We're going to talk about all of that. But very first, what we have to do, actually, is to talk about our boy, Gail. Okay, so we did do a sort of um, retrospective, like, dive character analysis of PETA for the last book. Um, and PETA is not present in like about half of the Mockingjay. He doesn't come in until about a third to a half of the way through. Um, before then, you only experience him through the screens um, in the propos that the Capitol is doing. So it's really mostly Gale that Katniss is heavily interacting with in this particular book. So we thought this would be a good time to actually really talk about Gale himself as a character and what he means to this trilogy. Um, so, you know, just like PETA, Hungry Games from Gale's perspective would be quite interesting. I'm not sure it could be a whole trilogy of books, but like, uh, especially like his perspective of this book, I think would be quite interesting because he's doing some things that Katniss doesn't really fully understand because she doesn't care. So she doesn't engage with it until the very end of the book, right? So I would love to like get more information on Gail's thought process and what, what he really thought he and Beatty were doing because by the end, he's so unhappy 
with what he and Beatty did. And it's kind of surprising that he didn't really think about it in a way because he's been so politically engaged since he was very young. So I would love to see like his actual thoughts as opposed to like where we are with kind of like guessing a little bit at what he was thinking and why he was doing what he was doing. I so disagree about him being politically engaged since he was young. I don't think Gail was politically engaged. I think Gail was, I think we all know a Gail. And by the way, I, I do want to say this, that we've, I've shit on Gail a lot through this series, <laughs> uh, but I've shit on Gail through the perspective of Katniss's love interest, mm-hmm. not as the character. The character is fascinating. And I think the character is the everyman. I think an everyman is Gail. Um, and while Gail has seen and lived through the horrors of District 12, he has no clue beyond what he sees and what is given to him by propaganda from the Capitol. So by the time that he enters this realm of being able to engage in war games, he has no clue or idea of like the people whose lives he's putting in danger are actually people. Like he's, he's, I, I compare him to like playing video games or solving like high hypothetical math problems. Like they're not people. So do you think uh, that that's not political engagement though? Cause I feel like young people do that a lot. Like they, they are, have political thoughts, usually angry, kind of like Gail's are. And they, they're wrong a lot of times because they don't know things. But that's not not being politically engaged. That's just being wrong about your politics. No, I think that prior to this, his politics were let's run away from the system. He didn't engage in it. But that is politics. Is that? You, yes, that's a legitimate political opinion to say, like, I'm going to disengage from the system and go live in the in the woods and, you know, cook over a fire. Like, that's a legitimate a uh, political thought that you can have. I think it's wrong. And I think it's very selfish and dumb, but mm-hmm. it's still political. I, I think it's childish. I think it's yeah, impossible. super childish. Right? Like, I think, but I think that the first time that he checks in is in this book. Oh yeah, that's like, for he's sure. checked out. And so he isn't, I, I, and I think that, that that gives him almost a privilege to not be aware of so much of like BB is aware of the consequences. Queen is aware of the consequences. Katniss is aware of the consequences. He isn't because he was checked out for so long that coming back in and being like, oh, we could do this thing is like not even considering that what this thing is doing is killing children. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I do agree with that. I think that that is very true. Um, I just think what he was doing before was political as well. It was just political the way a child yeah. can be political. Like teenagers can only, can only, uh, conceive of certain things because uh, they're just simply too young and don't have enough life experience to understand, you know? Yes. Yeah. I love to see P- Gail's and Peta's perspectives. Yes, totally agree. Mostly because Mockingjay is the only book I've ever enjoyed without caring about any of the characters. That's so mm-hmm. interesting. We have talked before, Koneka. I don't know if you've watched the other episodes about how in a lot of ways Katniss is actually like a, seriously a bitch. <laughs> So I can I can see how you could read the Hunger Games and not really like any of the characters, um, but still enjoy it because the main character is the system. And there's not a lot of other YA books where the system is truly a character the way that it is in the Hunger Games. Usually you have to read adult books for that sort of thing to come into play. Yeah. No, it is a, it, it is a rarity. And um, I think it's actually also a rarity that is that is uh, only this genre. Yeah. This post-apocalyptic dystopian YA genre that, and or I guess it doesn't have to be YA, but that that genre that allows it to be, yeah, um, yeah. the speculative fiction genre. Specul- well, yes. that's that's everything, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so it's so interesting what Gail goes through because he he go in the first two books, it's very clear that he is motivated to be part of the rebellion. Like that is that is his desire from day one. He The very first political opinion that we hear in these books is Gail talking to Katniss about like their conversation in the woods in the very beginning, right? So he, he has these ambitions from a very young age. So the second that he is able to act on those ambitions, he does and he goes full in, like he is all there, um, like he has complaints about how District 13 is run, but at the end of the day, 
it doesn't yeah. seem like it matters to him that much because they're letting him be his little rebellion soldier, which is what he's always wanted to do. Well, it's like joining an extremist group. Yes. It's that concept of like things things aren't moving and hey, this group is getting shit done. Mm-hmm. And something, even if it's extreme, is better than nothing because I've been mm-hmm. living with nothing my whole mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's like that excitement of like, oh, I'm actually contributing to something. Oh, I'm actually doing something. Oh, this, that, and the other thing. How else can I help? How else can I help? And then all of a sudden he finds himself with a finger on the trigger and realizing that he's responsible for the death of hundreds. Yeah, honestly, he's like he's like that teenager that's like, if, and you, I'm sure you've, you've all have encountered this before, that teenager working in a retail job and they finally get like shift manager, right? And they're like a 19 year old shift manager and they think that that like means something and they can do something and that they're powerful. They're not. <laughs> they're not, but they feel that way and act that way. And that's w- what I think Gail is really doing here. Like he's the 19 year old shift manager who finally gets yes. to feel like he's doing something with something. And I think that like, like if we look at it as as a whole too, all the other characters that we meet have directly killed somebody or have been the reason for somebody's death. Yes. Uh, Except I think the only argument is PETA. Uh, I don't think he ended up killing anybody in either games. That's because PETA's too Uh, good. He's the best. Best boy. He's the sunshine. But, (laughs) um, But was directly in hand with and helped like kill people uh so but it is that idea of um Katniss like has had blood on her hands and every single person that is the main character has had blood on their hands until Gail Mm -hmm. uh and then Gail sits there and and like that's where it hits him Mm of being like not only am I not power and not only am I like a tool in a pawn in this system even in the system that's being rebuilt. Uh, I caused a lot of harm. Mm-hmm. And I became the thing that I that I wanted to take down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's a huge fucking thing to realize. Right. And I think Gail, like because of all of this, he reading this as an adult, like he's quite relatable to adults. Because mm-hmm. I think we have all been in the situation where like someone comes to us that we look up to and they want our advice and they want our help and they want our expertise and how that feels and what that does. And I think we've all been in similar situations where like you've made a decision because you were involved and you had to make a decision, um, usually in the workplace, but this could happen in a household as well. And you just did not foresee the consequences at all. And you, you look back and you're like, I could have figured out that this was a bad way to do it, that I should not have shared this information, but you know, it's too late by then. And I think we all do that from time to time um, around Gail's age until we learn to be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about like trying to, to figure out how the information we share, the expertise we share may be used because he is, he is used and mm-hmm. like before he felt used by the capital because of the system that he was in, which isn't untrue. But in this way, when he helps with the rebellion, he gets directly used. Like he can draw a direct line from Prim's death to his expertise that he shared. And that is devastating for him. Now, I'm not saying anything that I have ever done professionally made people die. Like I'm not saying that, but I have definitely made decisions that caused people to get fired when maybe I could have made a different decision where they wouldn't have been or situations yeah. like that. And I think we've all like been in something like that where you feel guilty afterwards and you're like, oh my God, I should not have even opened my mouth or I should have recused myself from that project or I should have made a different recommendation or, you know, whatever the case may be. And it doesn't even have to be on a professional level. It could be like, I should have stayed out of somebody else's drama or mm-hmm. I should have like, or I should have just like not said the secret that was not mine to share. I shouldn't have ratted out a sibling, like something mm-hmm. like that. It's that same. It's that very same feeling of like that. You aren't the person that hurt that, but you are a part of it. You enabled mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so that that powerless feeling of being used hits him. That recognizing his own culpability in the situation hits him. Um, and I think what we see for most of this, 
for most of the book and most of the many books, there is a clear misunderstanding from Gail of who Katniss is and what her experiences are. Uh, they're on the same wavelength in the very first part of the very first book. Um, but even then, he's talking about running away, and she's sitting there and being like, "I can't. I have a. I have a. I have a sister who, or I have a sister I have to take care of, and a parent who's not dialed in." Um, and then, uh, but but like they, but he can kind of understand that. And as soon as he goes, as soon as she goes into the Hunger Game, uh, he doesn't have the context or ability to get it until the very end of the series. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's when they say goodbye to each other because he recognizes like, I have misunderstood you and now I know you better than I'll ever know, but we can't be together for that reason. Yeah. I mean, truly like, I, okay. There was never a world where Katniss and Go were going to get together. That was never going to be how the books went. However, Gail really doesn't I mean he knows that to some degree because he expresses to Peta like she's going to choose whoever she thinks she can survive the best with so like he knows it on some level but he doesn't really know it until that conversation where he's talking to her about what happened to Prim and he is admitting that he knows she will never be able to fully forgive him she will never be able to erase the thought that somehow it was it was him that it was did come from his idea because he knows that it basically did. That it basically did. Well, and he, so, yeah, and he won't be able to forget it. Like even if she did, yeah, he that blood is now stained on yes. her hand. In like, his mind, he killed would, Prim. It, he did. Yeah, it would. I mean, it would be like tr- if the if the love interest was Rue's brother. Like it, yeah. it, it, Kat, it would never work because Katniss would feel that guilt over Rue, even though she did everything she could to protect Rue. Rue died because of this, that, and the other thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that same guilt exists inside of Gale and Gale understands Katniss for the first time in the entire book series and, and, and has that conversation and, and owns it. Mm-hmm. Your team Katniss could have, should have gone solo Koneko. Well, you'll have to stay and hear what we have to say about the epilogue at the end of this episode. <laughs> because we're going to talk about it. Don't worry. All right. So yeah, so that's like, that's Gail. And we really wanted to take a moment to just really talk a little bit about like him specifically, because in these past couple of episodes, as has been pretty clear to you guys, me and Landon both are basically on team Katniss and Peeta team. Um, what is it? Everlark. Uh, you know, so we we didn't want to we didn't want to like leave Gail behind because Gail's not a bad character. I don't dislike mm-hmm. Gail. I simply dislike the shippers of Gail and Katniss. Sorry. It's just it's just true. Um so yeah, Gail I you're think, cool, I think the shippers <laughs> the shippers just have a misunderstanding of the character. I think so. Like they're, they're, I think so. in order for in order for the relationship to work, both characters would need to be drastically different or the world that they live in needs to be different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If this was a UA where the Hunger Games doesn't exist and you want to do a contemporary friends to lovers UA with a character that is Katniss flavored and a character that is Gale flavored, I'd ship that shit in a second. Because absolutely, that makes sense. But you have to take all the things that make Hunger Games out of the Hunger Games yeah. in order for that to happen. You'd have to kind of make all new characters. Like, they'd have to just be, like, a Katniss-like character and a Gale-like character. There couldn't even really yes. be Katniss and Gale. It it would be, yeah. No, it wouldn't. It would not be this. So it's... He's a good character. He's a really relatable character. I think he's the character that most... That is easiest to understand and easiest to empathize with. Mm-hmm. Uh, outside of Katniss because we're in her mind. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it was never going to be Gail. Never going to be Gail. Sorry, Gail. You're cool, but not for Katniss. Let's talk right. about District 13. Okay. So District 13, let's talk about them like as a character. And what I wanted to, um, what I wanted to really mention in regards to District 13 and kind of why I believe that Suzanne Collins structured District 13 the way that she did is the concept of capitalist realism. So I want to take just a quick second, okay, to do a little definition, okay? So 
what the concept of capitalist realism basically is, and I'm going to dumb this down so anybody that actually like academic knows what I'm talking about. Sorry, you can comment down below with like what capitalist realism actually is. But anyways, um, it makes it difficult. Like when you're living in capitalism, uh, you everybody is like working towards the system in such a way and in enmeshed in the system in such a way that it makes it difficult for your mind to imagine other systems like especially the social democratic government paired with the capitalist economy like we have in almost every country in this world it makes it very very difficult to imagine other systems could potentially exist in a way that wasn't necessarily true in the days of like monarchy and mercantilist capitalism for example because every single individual wasn't so like enmeshed in it and 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 simultaneously um you know hurt by it and given hope by it in in kind of the way that like you know the the best way the best way to build a relationship with with uh with somebody and like um kind of endear them to you and psychologically this has been proven and by the way don't do this this is because it's actually abusive and horrible but is to make the rewards and risks unpredictable right so like you you sometimes uh you you have like a really beautiful date and it goes really well sometimes the date ends up in a screaming fight um not too often just every once in a while and you never know which it's going to actually be and that is actually what makes your brain latch on and capitalism kind of does that to us. And so it makes it difficult for our minds to understand anything else when you've lived in it during your whole life. And because of that, capitalist systems uniquely uh, replicate themselves in ways that prior economic and political systems that we had in humanity didn't really do. And that's why District 13 is how District 13 is so i'll get off that for a second i'll let landon talk for a minute can you just can you explain to everyone like how is district 13 like because we had the summary uh, but like what is district 13 really doing uh so so district 13 is running like a i would like to say it's running more like a oligarchy meets monarchy as far as there are different levels it's very military militarialistic so uh, there are different levels of uh, people who are in charge. Uh, it is supposedly voted in. You have a president. You have people under that 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 president takes advice from, uh, and then from there you have certain levels of uh, soldiers. And so what they are doing is they are trying to organize a society that is also a rebellion. Uh, so their their politics and the way that they run uh, are also in terms of the way that they fight or that the way that they uh, attack or the way that they continue to build. Uh, so when new people come into the system, such as District Twelve or any of the uh, or any of the uh, not rebels. Um, what is it? A person who is dispersed from where oh, they are supposed to be refugees. Refugees. You're refugees. refugees from but other any, districts. From other districts, uh, they come in at the bottom of the totem pole in a system that is completely different uh, from what they are used to, uh, and and because of this, there is a there is a level of like socialism happening here because everyone is like getting what they need but there's also levels of worth as you continue mm -hmm. to move up ranks it's like an uh, incredibly it's, hierarchical kind of sort of socialism yeah. because they are all of their basic needs are being met in a socialist paradigm but absolutely none of their higher needs are so there are there is no sense of community there is no sense of camaraderie there is no sense of like actually bonding with the other people in a meaningful way and this is seen really well whenever it's like time to have the wedding and the district 13 people kind of don't get it like they don't understand like what like what's a they're kind of almost like it's so stupid but they're almost kind of like what's a party why would anybody want to do that that sounds so lame <laughs> yeah well and also like 
coins genuine like unlikability yes uh and 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 coin is a very unlikable leader that is something that is like written into her character that she gets a little bit more and these people voted for her goes on. and they voted for her uh, <laughs> yes uh <laughs> but uh there is like just a, but there it's very militar militaristic Militaristic. because again militaristic militaristic thank you militaristic because they are fighting like you are expected to be a body and you're kind of trained to be a body from the point that you are born that you are going to eventually go out to fight and if you die you die for the cause uh, and that the fact that there's an entire society with that sort of belief set mm-hmm. is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is it is it is interesting because it's because it is one of those things where it's like, would that really work? And on a small scale, it does. The thing is, is that it starts falling apart when more people get added to it. Uh, and it very, very quickly, as we see, and as was said in the summary, devolves into fascism. Mm-hmm. Because the uh, as more people get into it, uh, the amount of power that the leader has uh, expands exponentially. And uh, the need to keep control becomes a lot more difficult. So rules become a lot more stern and strict and what is right and wrong gets a lot more easily defined. Yeah. Like the the level of how punitive District 13 is, is like so extreme, like even so much more extreme than I could ever imagine the capital being. Like how um, anal retentive they are about someone taking an extra piece of bread. And like, I get it. They have lived in such scarcity that they feel that that's necessary to do. But at the same time, like... They're willing to waste so much resources and energy and time on punishing the people that just barely step a toe out of line. And it's like, is that really worth it? Is that actually saving yourself? Like, no, it's not. It's really not. Um, so but when you ca- only have like 500 members. Right. It's really easy to do that. Yes. It's an unsustainable uh, the larger you get, it becomes unsustainable, which yes. is what we see. You can't have you can't have a high control group of five thousand people. You can have a high control group of five hundred people. That's basically what's happening here, and uh, well, and they're not willing to change. And which is that I think is what bothers like Katniss and a lot of the other victors that she's talking to. You know, like um when she's talking to how much uh Joanna and Finnick and all of those people are like bothered by the various things in District Thirteen. Um, it's really about like their unwillingness to do anything differently or listen to anyone else, because even though all of these refugees have lived under the capital, like they still have knowledge and expertise that would help District 13. And they're just they're just not interested. They're just as uninterested in hearing how things could be better as the capital is. It is no different in reality that the lowest classes face no different. It is not. Yep. Uh, and then, yeah, it's. And then also, because of that lack of community, because of that lack of camaraderie, because of that, like, lack of worth in the individual person, uh, it becomes really easy for these guys to go to war, to kill people, to then turn and sit there and say, hey, the. The capital is the enemy. Therefore, people who live in the capital are not worthy of living mm-hmm. or are not people, mm-hmm. uh, which is like why the things like the second wave bombing are so easily done because and no one bl- blinks an eye at the idea of like, oh, who are we going to attack? We're not only going to attack these people originally, but then we're going to attack the first aid workers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. And that's why um, why Katniss and the other victors are dangerous, because they know firsthand that the capital citizens are just as oppressed as everyone else. Just because they get fuller bellies doesn't mean they're not oppressed. They are just as much as everyone yeah. else. And the victors are some of the few people in the world that that know this firsthand and truly understand it and can actually like um, explain it to others in a, in a way that they would, you know, they would get it. 
So, uh, so yeah, Katniss is not not just helpful to Coin. She's a huge liability to the entire district and the district spreading its way that it works. You know what? I just yeah. realized the reason I don't care about any of the characters is because the characters are taking attention away from the setting, and there's a lot going on in the book that conveys in a too neutral way because it keeps trying to character focus when it really isn't. You got it, Koneko. It's the it's uh it's the genre. It's because it's it's bridging the gap between two different genres, and um and it's probably the best example of this like it does it better than any other but what exactly what you just said is why when you think about these other YA dystopians that they just totally fail they just totally 100% mm-hmm. fail um and why Hunger Games is the best of the bunch by far Hunger Games is world first end of yeah. day it is world first character second yeah uh, and it has some great characters but the story the the story is told the best way to highlight the world And I think also why it would be the only YA that I sit there and say that, like, you know what, we need multiple point of views and I want multiple point of views and books to be republished from different points of view because I want to know more about the world. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. through different character lenses, we would be able to see more. We'd be able to see more about what the capital actually fucking does to PETA if we had PETA's point of view. We'd be able to see Gail's point of view in these District 13 meetings like that. That would be really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, totally so agree, District- Koneko, that's, but that's why I love it when I find one that I actually really connect with, like the Hunger Games. So, yeah, uh, well, District 13 is not possible without a certain person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That and person is Coin, that's Coin, President Coin, yes. Uh, who, by the way, in the movies, we're gonna have a whole episode about the movies, but like, I'm just like the perfect casting. Oh this, my god, she's so good in the movie. She's so <laughs> fucking good in the movie. Uh, Coin is an unlikable leader uh, and truly proves the animal farm lesson of absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, she is put in as president uh, of a very small colony in District 13. Uh, she runs it like a military is supposed to be run. She makes the decisions throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire revolution and the rebellion. Uh, she continues to gain followers and gain traction. She becomes a little bit more charismatic as we go on and she learns uh, and then decides to put herself as president uh, when they eventually take over the capital. Without a doubt, uh, and from there, then decides that you know what the Hunger Games was a really good idea, uh, but what if we did it with Capitals children instead? And I think um, such an interesting t- decision to make the person from District Thirteen do that because District Thirteen didn't have to give up anyone in the Hunger Games. So they never had, like they did until the rebellion silenced them, but that was well before Katniss was born. And so President Coyne might have been a part of that, but probably wasn't. Uh, District 13 uh, never had to watch as their children went into the Hunger Games, never had the horror of having to experience that. Uh, And so the fact that she suggests that is because she... It, it was always a hypothetical to her, not a reality. Yep. Yep. And in addition to being willing to host the Hunger Games, like let's just let's just list President Coin's sins. The planned hospital bombing. Okay, this is our yeah. first clue that President Coin is bad, actually. Like they go into this hospital, like Katniss goes into this hospital, and as they're leaving, the hospital gets bombed. And what we learn from Katniss is that it's not that they know Katniss is there. They're not trying to bomb Katniss. This was a planned raid. And I always found this part very curious because, okay, so District 13, their intelligence knows that it was a planned raid, but that means that they sent Katniss in knowing she could die in the bombing. Like they were, Coin was trying to kill Katniss from go, okay? From From jump, Coin wanted Katniss dead. Like that That was it. And she wanted Katniss dead and she wanted Katniss hurt and she didn't care like what she had to do to make that happen. And all because she thought that Katniss might run against her in a new election. That's it. So stupid. 
I actually am not sure. Yes, that was definitely part of it, especially the motivations later on. But I also think um, at that point in time, Katniss had tried to film propos that she was bad at. She was so uh, bad. Because she was so bad. The only time we like Katniss is when she's being authentic. Uh, So her trying to be inauthentically authentic was terrible. And I think I think President Snow saw that and was like, hey, this person would be better off dead for President us. Coyne. President would Coyne. Be saw that. President <laughs> Coyne. Yes. President Coyne saw that uh Katniss was is like, hey, you'd be a better you'd be a better as a martyr than you are as this terrible actress trying to film these propos. Uh, and <laughs> that was a huge part of it. And then when uh Katniss survived filmed a fantastic propo and started gaining power from the other rebellion re- rebels and coin started seeing that i think that was the moment that she started getting insecure about her position mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Well, she wanted katniss dead from the get-go i think those motivations changed slightly along the way but so what that she what wanted. that means, so if that's true, what that means is first Coin wanted to kill Katniss because she's useless. And then yes. she wanted to kill Katniss because she was threatening. So like how evil is that? That you're willing to kill someone just because they're useless? Like, oh, this is an extra mouth to feed. I don't want to feed them, kill them. Like but remember what the fuck? that's that's District 13's mm-hmm. thought. Yeah. Like we, we're also coming off of District 13, whom uh was almost wiped out completely because of the plague. Yep. Because of a uh, plague that came through and kind of just like threw people to the wolves mm-hmm. for that. Uh, you survived or you didn't. <laughs> and that was the stance that it took on it. And so coming out from that and then sitting there and being like, hey, you're useless alive. You'd be a lot more useful dead. And you're just a person. Mm-hmm. I also do believe that coin gets more evil as the rebellion goes on. Yeah. Um, Like, I think that that is that is pretty clear. And I think this is also incredibly realistic. So just in the past couple of decades, there's been quite a lot of study into like what power does physically inside of the brain. And um, statistically, like on average, not every individual, obviously, but on average, somebody that's got a significant amount of power for example, they're like a high high up politician, they're the CEO of a company, you know, et cetera, whatever it is, like actual power, um, they are far more likely to have brain damage. And if you scan their brains compared to the brains of like somebody in a, a car accident, for example, they have a similar amount of brain damage as someone whose brain was physically harmed. And like, I think that that says an awful freaking lot. And so it's kind of almost it, it's kind of you kind of almost wonder, like, um, you know, should should any human be in charge of more than a couple hundred other humans? Maybe that shouldn't be a thing ever. Maybe that should never, ever be a thing because it literally causes brain damage. So uh, coin literally gets stupider and crueler as the book goes on um, yeah. because she has brain damage. Uh, she makes poor, worse and worse decisions, Mm -hmm. uh, crueler decisions, um, and of course it being the, the idea of blaming the bond, like, like there's a, there is a choice here of like being like, oh yeah, President Snow did the bombing and then letting Katniss talk to President Snow, like, like that President Snow wasn't going to be like, yeah. We didn't do that. Your new president did that. And that coin was just going to assume that Katniss believed coin and didn't believe president snow. Or that it just didn't uh, matter. She might have just thought, like, who matter. cares if Katniss learns that we did it, that it's it's over now. You know, she's powerless so and I'm powerful. Mind. Like, that could have been the thought. And so it's just like, wow, that's a very different coin that we saw earlier that was trying to secretly plan how to kill Katniss and just instead write her off. Uh, a very different 
yeah, there's a lot of brain damage that happened there. Yeah. <laughs> like, my God, was that the dumbest decision ever? Like, free, like, what the heck, you know? Like, what did she think that, that her talking to Snow was going to do? Absolutely nothing good. There's absolutely yeah. n- no ca- type of conversation those two could have had that would have been beneficial to Coin. But Coin yeah. thought had so much power at that point. Like, she didn't care or she didn't think about it or whatever. Um, and she just let it happen. Just let it happen. Well, there's and then there's an interesting pipeline that exists here, and it's uh, it's the liberator to tyrant or the liberator to fascist pipeline, uh, and it is this idea of someone recognizing that a system is broken, that people are being oppressed and wanting to liberate the oppressed uh, people, and gaining power among the oppressed. And then gaining more power and then using that power to oppress the people who were originally in power. I don't know if this sounds like World War II and a certain dictator with a mustache to anybody, but it certainly sounds like that or anything that happened in Cuba or... It's happened in a lot of regimes, like le- left and le- ones that were at their core leftist and ones that were at their core right wing. Mm-hmm. They all tend to do this no matter where they start politically. Like they slowly march towards this like reactionary right wing thing, you know? Well, and it's and it becomes about the idea of I can be a liberator. Like, yeah. here's the deal with President Coyne. President Coyne is a fascinating character. We see this a lot more in the movies than we necessarily see it in the books, but we have a little bit of a hint of it during this conversation with Katniss. He enjoys the system as it is. He is not about his leadership. He is about upholding the system as it exists. President Coyne is all about herself. Mm Mm-hmm. It is not about what the system will look like. It is about how she will rule it. Mm -hmm. And there is that difference there of like, you both are bad, but President Coyne is almost worse because of it. Almost. It's kind of like how when like your your side betrays you, that's how Mm -hmm. it feels with Coyne's evil versus Snow's. So it feels more personal. Like you want to say, Coyne, girl, you know better. You know better. And so it hurts more know. when she is does her evil things versus when Snow does his evil things. But there's actually nothing that would tell her she does know better yeah. because she yeah. doesn't know better. She doesn't know better. But you feel like she, she should. You feel like she should. But she you feel doesn't. like she should because she, we are told that she is the good guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she isn't. She didn't yeah. grow up in the system that is broken. She came in and said, hey, I know how to run this small system of 500-ish people in a way that we run it. I run it successfully. And our history has told us that we need to break free of the system that we were once a part of and that you're still being oppressed by. So let me let me free you. Let me be your let me be your champion. Let me be your liberator. Uh, And how that turns into fascism. Uh, It's it's it is definitely that choice of like, hey, the devil you know is bad, and so is the devil you don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Both are evil. Both are very evil. <laughs> they they are the same person, just in different <laughs> shapes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. All right. So that next brings us to our sponsor break. Okay. So um, like all of our podcast episodes, today's is sponsored by Audible. So um, where'd my mouse go? There it is. I'm going to get y'all the link. I'm going to get y'all the link. Audible. Here we go. So um, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. I highly recommend Audible as always. That is what I use to read all of the books that we read on here. I am an audio book girly, okay? I love me some audio books. They're the best. I love to just sit and listen. You know, um, it is, it's especially good while I'm doing chores or while I'm in the car, um, you know, or things like that. So I'm able to read so much more. Uh, with my lifestyle using an audio book. The Hunger Games audio books are particularly good, as I've told you guys on every Hunger Games episode, uh, narrated by the ineffable Tatiana Mason Lee. Okay, Miss She-Hulk, Miss Orphan Black. She does an amazing job um, at doing Katniss's voice and helping us hear the book from Katniss's perspective. 
Um, so if you're interested in that, I would recommend getting that. But Landon also has an Audible recommendation for us. So besides getting the Hunger Games trilogy, what would you recommend people get from Audible? So here's the deal. I just recommended this book, but I need everybody to read it. And that is Fourth Wing. Which we're doing is it the again. Book that we're doing it again, you guys. We're doing it again because I've read it again. Uh, I downloaded the audiobooks so that I could listen to it again. I've had three of my friends, Karen is not one of them yet, no, not uh, yet. get to read this book. And every single one of them has texted me, what the fuck did you do? You ruined my life. This is incredible. Uh, <laughs> what an endorsement. <laughs> What an endorsement. It is an amazing book about, uh, yes, there is, it is a uh, militaristic college world that is taking place during a war that involves uh, a young girl college age uh, to put her life on the line and join a very uh, elite group of people who become dragon riders. Uh, as she tries to tackle her first year of learning about these magnificent beasts while also discovering the politics behind the world may not be as as forthright as she originally thought and that the boy that she hates might actually be the, on the right side of things and that she, as a disabled uh, neurodivergent woman, uh, can find power in this really elite group of people uh, people it is overall the best book i have read this year everybody needs to read it and the audiobook is fantastic so glad and i think what you told us last time it is it is for real actual facts enemies to lovers yes Love it that. is for real it's not fakey enemies, enemies to lovers enemies like to book lovers. talk sometimes will tell you we'll that. something is and it isn't this is for real right this is for real and then also the world and book exist without the love story so the love story is just it's in there it's a subgenre, but the rest of the world and the rest of the book is fantastic even if you took out the spicy part oh i love it that's awesome so please please Read it because it is fantastic. Fourth wing, fourth wing, fourth wing by Rebecca okay. Yar. Uh, the third one, the second one comes out uh, the end of this year, November. So okay, so there you go. You so you can read the first one and then you can say, "Get me the second one for Christmas." Um, you know, to whoever struggles to buy gifts for you. So there we go. Yes, or by then you might have a credit on Audible if you're doing the subscription. True. True. All right, that is our that is our ad break. Thank you guys for listening. Let's continue. So we were talking about President Coin before, and so we kind of want to go from that into Katniss and Katniss actually gaining some political thoughts and opinions of her own. So the way I see Katniss in the first two books is kind of along for the ride. Like she understands politics in the way that like somebody living as an oppressed person understands them. But she's young and she doesn't really think that deeply about these things. So she doesn't have a lot of like political thoughts of her own. Like if you asked her like what her opinion is on the Capitol, like the most she could say is like they suck. You know, she really could not go into any more detail. She doesn't even have a lot of emotions um, towards them the way that Gail does. She only gains negative emotions towards the Capitol when they put her herself through the Hunger Games, right? So in this book, we see a little bit of a different Katniss because she's being put in the position of like filming these propos and actually being a piece in Coin's game, which is slightly different than the way she was a piece in the Hunger Games. She starts to develop political opinions of her own. Um, and I think it really starts with the fact that she can't lie on camera. She cannot yeah. be inauthentic. It is just simply something that's not in her blood, right? Like the way that she does these propos, like they're crazy. They're like, no one can be that bad of an actress. And yet there's Katniss. Yes. Uh, she is She is really, really bad at being the pawn in the game that coin wants her to be which is safe and away but seemingly being this this inauthentic version of herself uh and i think that that's something that 
has always been with Katniss. Katniss never played the people game. She didn't like people in the second one. She certainly like that was what that was what uh, Peta was good at was playing the audience, playing with like people. First, yes, even yeah, Gail. Or like in the first book, Gail like Gail was the one that did a lot of the interactions for them selling their game. Like she always yes. had someone else do it for her. She was she was always this like tool. She she used her bow. And the points in time that people fell in love with her were the points where she couldn't control her reaction because something was something was comp- like uh, fighting her survival because that is the number one thing for Katniss is about survival. Well, here in District 13, she could survive just fine. She could put her head down become that person who was that she was in that first book before the Hunger Games and work and do what she needed to do in order to make sure that her sister was fed and then have a warm place to sleep, which was her ultimate goal in the first book, like in the first part of the first book. Uh, But then realizing, I think for her, she realizes that that's not just what she wants to do anymore. She's given this opportunity to kind of, it's a fake opportunity, but she's given the choice to not engage. And she realizes that she wants to engage as much as she has to engage. And then yeah. it's incredibly frustrating when she, when she's being told how she has to engage and she's not good at it. Well, because they write their schedule, they do like the thing where they write their schedules on their arms every day, right? Yeah. And she, she just totally blows off her schedule and no one punishes her for it. And so she kind of realizes that she could just live like that. She could just like show up to mealtimes and otherwise just fart around doing nothing. And like people would let her basically so long as she wasn't overtly breaking any rules. Um, But she doesn't want that. She doesn't want that. She does want to like meet some kind of political goals. And I think a lot of it is um, is motivated by like seeing everybody else and the lives that they lead and not wanting that for them right? Like she sees how involved and excited Gail is, right? She sees how Prim has become an adult in this world. And she's like doing like a lot of these medical tasks and and learning that. She sees that like PETA is still being tortured by the Capitol and she wants to save him from, for, you know, to repay him for everything that he's done for, for her. And so for the first time in her life, she has a moment where she is forced to have priorities other than surviving and so these become these very like political uh thoughts that she has and 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 i do think on one level like she wishes she could be good at the propos and i think that you see this kind of desire when she actually enlists and she becomes a soldier and you know they have they each have their little individual test as their final test right and she realizes like during the test that ah they're testing to see if i can follow orders I'm going to actually follow orders. And I think that's the moment where she decides like, nah, I am in it. I actually do want to be the Mockingjay and help everyone. It's not just well, about surviving anymore. I think it's I think it's attached to this concept of, if you've heard of this, the, the Hasler's hierarchy of needs, which is yes. a very big idea of psychology that a person uh, cannot thrive or think beyond themselves and their body if they do not have certain levels of functioning. So if they do not have water, clothing, warmth, food, uh, they cannot then focus on like relationships, family, social situations, like, and then from there can't like create or, or do money or art or whatever. Like it, it, there's a hierarchy of, of what you need to have in place prior to, being able to get to the next level. And Katniss is never sustainably, like her job was to make sure that she had that first level. And even then, most of the time, failed, was not successful in it, had to had to fight to get that first level for her and her sister. And then all of a sudden she is in this place where that's all taken care of. And that, that part of her brain can click on, could, get there uh in ways that like gail gail like yes he had to provide but he also had provided differently and he was able to provide that can click on a little earlier 
Yeah. And uh, also, uh, and also Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a general guideline. It's not like a strict, yes. exact thing in every single person. Katniss is a pretty extreme example of it. Gail is probably a little bit more realistic, you know. <laughs> yeah. But but I think that that like that that character concept of things, because mm-hmm. obviously she's a character, not a person. But that yes, concept yes. of it being like it wasn't until stability came that she was able to like focus in on the thing that was above survival Mm -hmm. which is now how do I play this game and get what I can out of it for myself and others Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and then like her her first like overt political act uh kind of the series of events that I would consider this act begins in the conversation where they are talking about like what the tributes are all voting on if they're going to have another hunger games or not and then mm-hmm. she votes, yes, let's have one. And then Hamish is the last vote. And he sides with Katniss oversiding with PETA saying that they should not. So like PETA and BD um, decide that there there should not um, be another hungry. Oh, and, oh, and, uh, and Annie. So those three are like, no, there shouldn't be. Katniss and Obaria and Joanna are like, yes, there should be. Hamish is the tiebreaker vote. And um, and tr- and I think in this time, Hamish probably for himself, like was just waiting for Katniss to vote and he was going to vote whatever she voted <laughs> in a way. But like um, so he he's the tiebreaker vote. But it really is Katniss. Like it's really Katniss that decides. And she she goes from that scene into um, into the scene of like, OK, we're going to uh, you know, it's snow. He's convicted. We're going to kill him. You get to kill him, Katniss. And then she decides to turn her bow on to coin okay and shoot coin instead of shooting snow now the results are that both coin and snow died but Katniss didn't kill snow Katniss killed coin even though this entire book she's been on and off talking about how much she wants to be the one to kill snow how much that's hers and she wants that so badly and then the moment she can get it she says nah this is my one opportunity I'm gonna shoot coin so uh, we wanted to also talk about here, like why she does that. So, when it comes to this decision, this is the only time I'm pretty sure the only time in the book that w- we do not see Katniss's like full step by step reasoning of why yes. she's doing what she's doing, which is so frustrating because now <laughs> we have to put it together ourselves. Yes. So, so okay. <laughs> so we as readers are meant to put this together ourselves. So before I give my take, I would love to hear your take, Landon. Why does she do this? Why she shoot point? I think I think that sitting in that meeting, realizing that coin was no better than snow. She just come from a meeting with snow where she finds out that coin is responsible for bombing her sister. She's sitting in this meeting, realizing that they have traded one terrible person for another. And she has to figure out how can I get close enough to end this because that is what I, that is what the goal is. Snow is going to die either way. He is ill. He has a sickness that is killing him. He is no longer in power. We have taken the capital. He will never be a threat again. He is, even though he is breathing, he is no longer a threat. Mm -hmm. This person is a threat. It is the same exact threat in a different mask. And so I am going to have to vote yes to do this public thing to get her to earn my trust so that I can shoot her. And for me, that shooting was like recognizing that this, that the, that this did not end with snow. It ends with this idea that this, the idea of the hunger games and corruption and power. And I think that Katniss realized that sitting in this meeting and that's why she shot. That's why she shot shot coin. So the only thing that I really think is different than that is that we, because we don't see Katniss's thought process, I believe she makes all of that decision last minute. Now, I know in reality, the reason why we don't see Katniss's thought process is because it would spoil the twist. Okay, it would spoil the excitement. So Suzanne Collins does not write it. And it's totally possible that Katniss, you know, does all votes yes for the Hunger Games and is having all these thoughts like in the meeting. It's totally possible. But that is not actually what happens in the text of the book. It's not. So I think... But what Katniss, happens who has never, who has always just gone on her gut, sees the opportunity, sees like, shit, I got my bow and coins right there. 
boop, and just decides that last minute. I think she has all those thoughts last minute. I think that if we if she had all those thoughts last minute, we'd see it happen last minute. But it does. She wasn't thinking, but it no, because she's not thinking that like having the Hunger Games is a good idea. She looks at Hamish and goes, I hope he votes with me because he trusts me. And that's not because she wants to see other Hunger Games. She doesn't. She's been very adamant about not wanting the Hunger Games again. And so voting for the Hunger Games and sitting there and being like, I hope Hamish trusts me, to me, the the fact that she voted, un- like, that was so against her character, and there is that, like, sign of, like, trust me on this, makes me think that it was pre-planned. If it was pre-planned, we should have had a thought. We should. This is like a writing mistake. I feel like we should have had some kind of thought we, of uh, that where she like tells us that she's got something planned because she doesn't. All she does is she, she does. says like she's but like trust I hope me. she does say I hope me. Hamish understands me. She does say that. She does. But, she does think that she says I no hope thoughts, you trust me. But there's no thoughts about like you know this is my opportunity now because here's the here's the logic of that the like the other step of the logic of of that theory right is that um. She knows that if she votes yes, then Coin will uphold her part of the bargain as far as letting her be the one to kill Snow. Like if she votes no, then Coin might renege on that, right? Like, but Katniss doesn't have any of those thoughts. Like she doesn't think like, oh, I'll get to kill Snow if I vote yes. Like she doesn't think that. So That's just the I'm reality writing- that we're meant to put together. So here's the deal with this though. Like I'm thinking of it on the writing aspect of it. We, it would have been fine. If that was the reason, if she voted yes because she still wants to kill Snow, we never would have had to have a meeting with Snow. No, we we never would have had we because Katniss could find out that thir- District Thirteen and Coin was responsible for the bombing with Gale. Could have she could have found she could have found that out that way. What we learn from that meeting with Snow is a distrust for Coin and also. Snow is going to die one way or another. That it is already dead. That his his fate is already written on the wall. Whether Katniss does it or they wait three weeks, he's dead either way. So that satisfaction of the arrow, like, has already been taken from Katniss. And on a writing standpoint, we wouldn't need that extra scene if she if we didn't need the character to be pushed in a way to like not kill Coin. Or not to kill snow. You know that, what's true that about this? Scene exists for her not to kill snow. You know what's true about this little sequence in, in reality is this is one of the few spots because of how well the coin is acted and because the movies don't actually show us every little thought Katniss has that this entire sequence is actually way freaking better in the movie. Yes, it is. Well, and, but you also have the you also have. Uh, more character depth to both coin and snow in this yes. because we see little snippets of them throughout both throughout all the movies mm-hmm. so you know these characters uh but i think like when you take apart a scene and go every single scene in a book needs to tell us something to drive the narrative forward what do we learn that is so special about this conversation between snow that we couldn't have learned anywhere else and that is vital and that is that snow didn't kill prim and that Snow was going to die anyway. And for me, for that, that is writing enough, convincing me enough that it, sh- it, it that the the thought process behind the author meant that the character this was pre planned. That is where that is that is the in text hints that I'm going with. Valid, <laughs> valid. I just it just doesn't match anything else in the way that Katniss has narrated the story up until this point. Every other time we've had hints, we've had clues, we've had thoughts that she's had that point us into the direction of where she's going to go. Even with the yes. berries, like she thinks about it before she does it. They don't wait. It, I think that this is the this is the point where uh, Suzanne Collins went, you know what would be really cool in the movie? To throw this <laughs> twist in there. And it doesn't match my writing style any other point in the three books that I've written, but we're going to put it in for the last 15 pages. Man, I'll tell you, when I was reading this when I was younger, I was surprised. I was like, oh, she didn't think she was going to do that. The heck? I was. I was surprised. No, it was was a great surprise, but I agree with you that it's like, we, in order to like, really know for sure, 
because everything has been said, because we've been with Katniss every single thought of the way, mm-hmm. we needed to have that. But mm-hmm. we didn't. And so now it's up for debate. So you viewers, tell us what you think. Was yeah. it pre-planned or was it instantaneous in the moment? Not pre-planned. And, I, and you can find like endless like Tumblr posts and stuff about this question more so than any other like analysis of Hunger Games because of the way it's written. So, and I um, think so you can have fun t- with like, that. Karen's Karen's opinion completely valid on this too. You're absolutely right. It does not match what this is, is not happening. how Katniss narrates. It's not. So yeah. So it 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 is up to interpretation. Yeah. There is we love when we disagree. There is no beef there about so it. So when you so when you do this for your kids, because I know you talked about like planning on on doing that for your students next year. Like I cannot wait to hear how this debate goes with some people well, who are like in that age. We're only doing Hunger Games. We're not doing the oh, whole trilogy. Oh, no. crushed. Yeah, but now I understand. They probably can't get through all three books their in a own. semester. Cannot get through all three books like this. No, absolutely crushed. not. Okay. Well, boo, my dreams of understanding what teenagers uh, think, because I don't remember. I just remember being like heck and hella surprised. And I wasn't even, when this book came out, I was like already kind of an adult. So, you know, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping that they'll read the next two after this, but it just won't be in the class. Yeah, who time. knows, though? Who knows? And they probably won't tell you about it. So, so we wanted, so we wanted to take a moment to talk about that because this is kind of like Katniss's one and only like true political act that she does in these books that are literally all about politics. So I think it deserves like it deserves some highlight, right? This is uh, this is like this is definitely like a moment. This is like a really important moment in the book. So we wanted to talk about it. I also think the moment that she realizes that she can negotiate, yeah, uh, for a political stance, but also for like her it changes how she starts thinking. Mm-hmm. I think that's also an incredibly important yeah. moment that she can sit there yeah. and be like, actually, I'm going to play this game too. I am of use to you. And so what can I get for that? Yep. Yep. Negotiation's good, you guys. Always ask for more. Always ask for more. Okay. We want to take a moment to highlight the evolving relationships because a lot of relationships have a, a conclusion here, but a huge, in, like, chance to evolve in this book uh so we wanted to take a chance to to go through some of our favorites Mm -hmm. uh they're all Katniss's relationships obviously given that she's the protagonist uh but I want to start with Katniss and Hamish yeah and family if you didn't think that there wasn't a bad family in here you're fucking wrong uh Hamish becomes dad like in some ways, uh, we go from reluctant mentor to using her to further a rebellion to like genuinely caring about her and like being a person to look after her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and so cute. it's a lot. Which is the best <laughs> character of the entire series, Koneko? That feels like such a that's so you. I believe you. Yes, <laughs> he is. We have like, there's a lot, we're going to talk about the epilogue in general here in a bit. But I, I feel like there's, I want to fight really hard for like Hamish's side on this because Hamish gets like his happy ending, even though it's not what most people would think a happy ending looks like. And that's because he found Katniss and Peta. Like it's mm-hmm. that it literally is that found family feeling of someone who was so isolated and drinking himself to death. And having to watch someone that he had to like emotionally get close to every year be ruthlessly murdered over and over and over again. To finally like losing all the tributes, he lost his his prior family beforehand because the capital slaughtered them. So he's he's never been able to hang on to any relationship with anyone. The only relationships that are consistent for him are the ones that he has in the capital once a year when he goes to be a mentor in the Hunger Games. And they're all fine. Like and as much as they are like as much as they are involved in friends, they're fighting against what, like, cause it is like, Hey, my person needs to survive sort of thing. Like yeah. you're still playing the game there. He has never had a genuine relationship since he was 17 years old. Uh, and he finds, he finds them in Katniss and Peta, and that's amazing. That. And it is, it is that like, he gets to be a little bit of a like dad or granddad to the kids eventually. And that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, I think it's, you know, Katniss's mom goes off and does her own thing, but it's okay. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. Peter and Katniss's kids still have a grand, a grandparent. It's Hamish. It's Hamish. 
Yeah. And and he like gets to just live a better life. And I love that. I love that he gets he goes back and Katniss isn't alone and they just form a little family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's so cute. And so yeah, seeing that seeing that transition from reluctant mentor to like using her to like actually value valuing valuing and protecting her. Mm-hmm. Love it. We love Haymitch. So next we wanted uh, to talk. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Did you want to say more about Haymitch? No, you go. You go. Okay. So next we wanted just to talk a little bit about this particular relationship, Katniss and Prim. So this is a relationship that is clearly important from the beginning, but I think that um, that it's not really fully realized how important this relationship is to Katniss until we get to Mockingjay. And that is because Prim is the embodiment of Katniss losing her innocence. And when we get to Mockingjay, we know Katniss has fully lost her innocence because Prim, even though she's young, she's a working adult now. Like she, she, uh, you know, early bloomer, right? Very precocious child, but she's, she is years old (laughs) at 14 years old at 14 years old. She is a full on working adult. And so Katniss's innocence, like it's gone. It's gone. And you see this with Prim. And I love the little additions that Prim gets in the movies in particular. I can't wait to like talk a little bit about Prim movie, movie Prim versus book Prim. I love like little little additions that we have like of Prim coming in and brushing Katniss's hair and things like that, that we don't get nearly as much of in the books. Um, Because it just really shows like how important that relationship is to Katniss, despite the fact that they don't interact directly all that much. Well, I think there's also, there's some interesting dichotomies that also happen in this relationship. Obviously, like when we first meet them, uh, Katniss is acting as a parent. She is, she is parentified a prim. Like she is, she is the person providing for her, making sure prim is eating, making sure prim is getting, you know, dressed for the Hunger Games and is then sacrificing her life for prim. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then in the end, while... Katniss has gone through and killed and caused damage and, and has obviously like been the piece in the face of the rebellion. Prim becomes a healer, like becomes goes from childhood to also being like a full adult whose job it is to heal the people that people like Katniss hurt. Uh, and there is an interesting difference there because even, even though it's like obviously not a commentary on Katniss shouldn't be hurting people. There is that interesting thing of like Katniss hurts and fight so that Prim can heal. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then unfortunately the biggest act of healing that Prim causes is dying because then Katniss gets to finally lose it and gets to like, and that sounds so terrible, but it is that it is the the straw that breaks the camel's back of holy shit, I've gone through all of this and now I've lost this person. Yeah, it's who... questionable if Katniss would have killed if if Prim had survived. It's very questionable if Katniss would have killed Coin. I she probably wouldn't have. Yeah, I don't think so. I think like that is the cat that 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 is the moment of like oh that is the moment of change of in the very first and in the very last. Mm-hmm. And it, Prim being like as a character used as that bark is a really interesting plot device. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that relationship changing is fascinating. And yes, it, they do a fantastic job in the movie showing how small those changes are throughout the entire series. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that it doesn't just suddenly seem so sudden, but it, it feels sudden because for Katniss, it is sudden. Yeah. Yeah. I love movie Prim. Can't wait to talk about her. Yes, for sure. All right, next one. So we want to talk next about Katniss and Joanna. Enemies to friends. Enemies to friends. Uh, This is the one that the movie leaves out. I completely forgot that these two become thick as thieves Mm -hmm. in the books. Uh, Mm -hmm. They become roommates. They become partners in fighting. Uh, Basically, Joanna is rescued from the capital and uh, is having a tough time of it because Joanna is just having a tough time of it. Uh, but so is Katniss. And 
there are two girls who have put up walls to shut everybody else out and then let each other in. And it's very cute. <laughs> I love it. And it's so it's so funny that they that they start out this kind of sort of pseudo friendship with um with Joanna hitting up Katniss for drugs because they're both yeah. getting they're both getting the morphling, but Joanna has developed an addiction to it um, that she doesn't want to she doesn't want to kick. And uh, I mean, Katniss ends up addicted to it, too, but she she like gets off of it. You know, she wants to kick it. Joanna doesn't really. So she comes and just takes Katniss's morphling and Katniss is like, it's easier to not fight her. I will just let her. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> the way that it's played her. Books is so funny. <laughs> um, and I think I think that Joanna is the only other person in the books that understands Katniss mm-hmm. that doesn't need anything from Katniss Mm -hmm. we looking at the victors uh you know Hamish has a profound sense of needing to take care of Katniss and for that Katniss like owes him something like it doesn't owe him something because he's taking care of her but like there is that uh, there is a relationship there that that has an expectation uh Finnick is like a healed version of Katniss he's He's gone above, he's getting married, he's found the love, like, he has found life through this. Joanna is stuck in the same circle that Katniss is stuck in. Mm-hmm. Um, that fear, that abuse of the capital, that hate, that anger. Uh, and so, like, being able to connect, like, have a female friendship connection, I think is so vital and so fascinating in this book. And it's so cute to see it. <laughs> it really is. I I like this relationship. It's just it's it's just fun to see Katniss interacting with somebody that's like just truly just her equal, just period. Yeah, and that's it. That's all that there is to it. And doesn't um, and doesn't want or need anything from yeah, her. Like, they yeah. can come to the table and just be like, "Hey, want to practice fighting?" And, like, and Katniss doesn't feel obligation to Joanna the way that she feels no. obligation to others. Because to others, she feels like, oh, they did these things for me and I owe them. She doesn't ever feel like she owes Joanna something. It's, no. So it's just like very pure. It's very pure. It's very nice. Yeah. I love it. And then we have Katniss and Finnick. And I kind of hinted at that last one. Uh, but like, they're, they're friends. Like, they end up friends. Uh, yeah. Finnick is is kind of the hope I feel like Katniss might have in some ways. He's found Annie. He gets to be with her in this book. Uh, they are in love and Finnick is, is kind of survived and gone. And, and even though he still has obviously stars and he's still fucking Finnick, uh, he, he, is, he is who I think she can see herself being one day in some way. Like we all have that friend where it's just like, Oh, I kind of want to be you when I grow up. Yeah, He's aspirational for her in a lot of ways. Um, but then there's also that interesting concept of like, he, when they first met, there was a lot of like taunting of her, of like trying to poke at her, of trying to get her secrets of not really being like honest with her. And that like, that that they weren't fighting because they were allies but that like butting heads and in the last moments of the next life Katniss gives like sacrifices a huge tool in order to show him mercy mm-hmm. and, uh, Finnick, and, and in the second book Finnick is the first um v- other victor you know besides Peta, of course uh that Katniss bonds with and actually considers a friend the first one yeah. and um and I think that just really shows like how how they uh how they get along. Uh, not gonna lie, Finnick is kind of goals in general. Teach me how to get my life together while in a stressful situation, please. Right? Like, I I hope that it that if I'm ever in as terrible of a situation as Finnick is, or even half as terrible, that I that I have the amount of composure and willpower that he has to to make the best of that situation. It's just it's also fucking just smooth talking. It really is. <laughs> it really is. But I think I I don't. But I don't ever get the sense that like. Finnick is lying or pretending like I think that he really is he's quite genuine you know when he says like oh well you know I traded in secrets like he figured out how to make make that lifestyle work for him even though he hated it like I think he really means it like I don't think he's kidding around you know Finnick would be a Slytherin just saying (laughs) Uh, (laughs) fight me Uh, (laughs) Mm. (laughs) all right all right next Pita. 
Oh. Katniss and Peeta. Uh, obviously, like, this is the big relationship, uh, the, the biggest one throughout the entire series. We go from, um, you know, him being completely enamored with her and her using him to a uh, profound sense of knowing that the only other person in the world who understands what you've been through is this other person uh, to loss and that being twisted uh, to eventually having an understa- understanding of this is what safety feels like. Because that is that is the thing that Katniss has been seeking this entire time. And that is the thing that PETA can provide for her, which is safety. Mm-hmm. Feeling mm-hmm. safe somewhere. Yep. And, and I, think it's, I think it goes both ways a little bit, right? Like, I, I know that, like, Katniss can't possibly choose anyone else but PETA, but PETA can't cho- possibly choose anyone else but Katniss because the thing is, is he's he is so, he is so, like, um you know, positive and caring on the outside that if he is with anyone else, no one else is going to understand, like, any time that he does have an, an episode. They're not going to understand how much PTSD he actually has despite how he behaves on the outside. So there is no other choice for PETA, just like there is no other choice for Katniss. Yeah. And and that these two have literally, like, would protect each other with everything that they have. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, PETA feels that way about Katniss and Katniss feels that way about PETA. And that there is this safety in the real and not real game that this tragic idea like really does get to define and make clear and in some ways provide communication in a world and in a relationship that would be impossible to navigate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, like, yes, absolutely. This, this was, there was never another choice. I know in this book specifically, there is this more of a love triangle ish feel uh especially with Peter being gone for the first half of the book but realistically it was never it was never not this. yeah it was always Katniss and Peter. it was always Katniss and Peter. so yeah all right you guys so since we went from there we next want to talk about the epilogue okay so <sighs> I we have to like talk about this historically first so when yes. this when this book dropped and people got to the epilogue, there was a section of the fandom that was fucking pissed. Okay? They thought this was the worst shit ever. Like how dare Queen Katniss go off and get married and have 2.5 kids in her perfect little Victor house. Okay? Yeah, Obviously and you why- can see the text here that says the perfect ending, so we're going to defend it. Why the epilogue is good actually. Well, and I kind of want to say on this, I feel like it was a large majority. It wasn't even just a section of the they fandom. They were loud. And then, you know what? They were loud. La- however many it was, they were loud. And then you also had people who were like, why did Katniss have to choose? Like, I know Kaneko stated that they were, you know, Katniss by herself. But it's like, that was also not going to be realistic. Uh, and I'm going to even argue that, that like, a subgenre of the Hungry is, isn't even romance. Like, this is not a romance story. It, it's just a, they, she was never going to be alone. Because <laughs> that's not the best Katniss, way to survive either. No. Katniss was, like, this, that whole group of people still adamantly get angry about this epilogue. So let's break down the things that they get angry about. Let's talk about, we've already talked about, and so I think it's just the easiest. Uh, Katniss ends up with PETA. Katniss ends up with Peta because A, uh, she doesn't have any family left. Mm-hmm. B, <laughs> he had a terrible family. Uh, and, and they're and, gone now too. <laughs> and they're gone now too. Yeah, they died. Uh, and uh, they were the only people at the end of the day who could understand each other mm-hmm. uh, because they lived through every horrific thing together. Those two are the definition of codependent, and there was um, there was not enough therapy in the world to untether them together. Did they even that have is... therapists? Did they even have no. therapists? And the... that's not even a thing. That's not even a job we ever see. For all we know, they are they are stuck, broken forever, and there's nothing they, they can stuck... do about it. And that just kind of is how it is. Uh, and they're they're making it work. 
Uh, they have their they have their ways to communicate. They give they provide each other the things that they desperately want. And the thing that Peter desperately wanted was to be the hero in somebody's eye because he was told for his entire life that he wasn't good enough and he was abused. And what Katniss wanted was safety. And that is a hundred percent what Peter offered. Yep. He never harmed anybody and he never harmed her. He only ever protected her. And that is exactly what she wanted. They gave each other exactly what they wanted. And of course they were going to end up in a relationship because of it. Yep. So what about the other thing that made everyone mad? Why she got to have kids? Why she got to have kids? Was she, her childhood was terrible. Why'd she have kids? What about that? It was stated in the book, in the very first book, that the reason why Katniss didn't want to have kids is because of the Hunger Games. She didn't want her kids to have to go through the Hunger Games. She did not want to put that through anybody. She didn't want to put them through it. She felt it was unfair to bring them into a world where they were going to have to go through this terrible, terrible thing. Well, guess what? The Hunger Games aren't a fucking thing anymore. Mm -hmm. So Katniss, even as cold and fucked up as she is and as much as I don't think she would be a good mother the only reason she didn't want to have kids was gone yeah so okay so like imagine this from Katniss's perspective the whole reason she doesn't want to have kids is gone so now her opinion on kids is probably moved from negative to neutral and PETA really wants kids and why wouldn't she do that for him like why wouldn't she of course she would of course, if he's like, I really want them, she would say, okay, Peta, let's have, like, duh, of course she would. <laughs> like, it's so stupid yeah. to me. Like, do these people, these people that have this opinion, I think, like, try to pretend that Peta, that she wouldn't take Peta's opinion into account, like, that that it's all about her opinion. Like, but Peta's, well, Peta's there. Like, he's, the, the 50% of this equation is him. I also think they make her so much more adamantly anti-kid than she actually is in the book uh like they I try to pretend that. they 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 try to be like well she never wanted kids and it's like yeah she never wanted kids because they were part of the hunger games there was no yeah. more hunger games uh i'm not saying that she was like kid happy after that i'm not saying that there isn't a world in which katniss didn't want to have kids at all but yeah she would have taken pe- like absolutely would have taken Peter's wants and needs into this consideration especially yes. if she felt neutral about having kids yes. uh yes i understand the frustration of the forced trope that happens in a lot of ya strong female characters where it's like you will not be happy unless you have or end up with a husband and have children and that epilogue seemed to come out of nowhere where 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 relationships that never talked about wanting to have kids all of a sudden have kids uh i i get the frustration looking at you uh, you know twilight that was like hey you can't have kids that's the whole thing and then found happiness with a child right like Mm -hmm. i get the frustration of that trope that's not what this is okay so let's talk about this all right so okay you might be saying karen and landon you hated that everyone paired off and had kids in the Harry Potter epilogue. You spent a whole segment talking about how shitty the epilogue was. Why is this epilogue amazing? The same thing happens because the same thing doesn't happen. Okay, so here's what the difference is. In Hunger Games, Katniss and Peeta have kids because that was what they wanted. In the in Haymitch, he goes off and he plays grandfather to these kids, right? In the books, him and Effie don't go off together. That's only in the movie, you guys, okay? Mm-hmm. So Haymitch gets his happy ending, which it does n- not him pairing off and having kids, okay? Katniss's mom goes off and has this amazing hospital career, okay? No kids. She doesn't decide, I need to settle down and have more kids. No, she's done with that. You know who also, also doesn't, doesn't go off and have kids? Gail, Gail. Gail doesn't go off and have kids. He goes off and has a career. Katniss assumes <laughs> that eventually he will get married and have kids, but we never hear about it. And that was not his goal. And that's not what he went off to go do. Okay. Literally, the only characters that pair up and have kids is Katniss and Peeta. That everyone gets a variety of different happy endings. Okay. Depending on their situation and their goals in life. In Harry Potter, everybody pairs off and has kids. There is no other possible happy ending. That Mm -hmm. is the difference. That's why this time it's good. And in Harry Potter, it's bad. It's because we are shown a variety of different happy endings. Yes, the main one is pairing off and having kids, but that's because that's what makes sense for that couple. 
and every other character gets something different that makes sense for them. Well, like, and how else do you, in an epilogue, you have a page and a half to show a happy ending. And if, if in the very beginning of a story, you said that this character who is all about seeking safety feels so unsafe in the environment that she has, that she is unwilling to have kids because it would make them unsafe. The natural, the na- even if the kid, even if that person, it doesn't make sense to have that person be a mother. The natural thing to show that is showing them to have kids because it's that change. It's that subtle hint of like, hey, this is a change enough in the character that I can't show you no matter how much inner monologue you have in a page and a half. Uh, it's it's not a sequel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a page and a half. Um, uh, I, love and that they, I, I love that they decided yeah. to have kids, but I think the point would hit stronger if the epilogue happened earlier when Katniss was still experiencing her first kid simply because I think the whole we're safe now is to establish by the time the epilogue happens. Katniss has already mostly processed it as far as she can process anything, and that's what makes it hit less hard. I just don't think that hitting hard is the point of the epilogue. I think the point of mm-hmm. the epilogue is to show that like everything's fine now and you can come off of the high of reading the books. Like it's the it's the letdown, okay? It is the it is like the the moment of um it's the hug after after the argument, right? That's what the epilogue is. So it's not supposed to hit hard. It's supposed to make you feel like you know, it's supposed to feel a little bit weak. So like, I just don't think that that's the point of it. Like I, I've heard that criticism before Koneko. I just don't believe that that's the point of an epilogue. No, I feel like the point of an epilogue, like giving like a visual physical sensation is like when you're taking a deep breath in and when you breathe out and you've breathed out for like a couple of seconds and you can feel finally your lungs, like, really relaxing because it's no longer full of air that's what the epilogue is it's like no longer that tension part it is it is after you let go of everything kind of like you were saying karen uh it you it it's not supposed to hit hard it's supposed to just be like this bright glimpse of hey this is where it went Mm -hmm. you fill in the gaps of how we got there but this is where you went i also think that like a couple years in their first kid would have been too close. Like, I, there's a lot of healing that probably came in parenthood there. But like, I think that if you're like, hey, five years after after this big war thing and everyone has a happy ending, you're like, that doesn't seem real. Yeah. Seven years, a little, ten years, a little bit more believable. Mm-hmm. The thing is, I had to read that blog twice to understand that Katniss is actually okay now. I would have liked to have the realization together with Katniss. I think, unfortunately... Um, from an artistic perspective, that has to live in fanfic. Like, I don't think that could live in the books. I don't think that no. realization could live in in the books and have them actually be structurally what they need to be to tell the story they're trying to tell. Like, that sounds like an absolutely great, um, uh, you know, chapter of a fanfic. But I just don't think it would I work in the book. I also don't think that there is ever a time that someone realizes that they're okay. Yeah. Especially after, like, after everything Katniss has been through, I think that moment would be after 2.5 kids. Like, I think that would be sitting in a field, not having to like worry about what's going to happen. Like, I think that that would be the moment. Yeah. Like those kind of realizations come in, in your, in your regular everyday life routine. They don't come, you know, in the middle of a change. Right. Yeah. When you're so far removed from it, like that's people realize that they are safe years after they've become safe yes i think that that's true as well so we like the epilogue actually this time we're not gonna bitch about the epilogue like we did in harry potter so here we go we like it um it's good it's good actually all right so um so that is that is the mocking jay so as we like to end all of these episodes we like to end it with a question so landon in 2023 does the mocking jay resonate I think we have a slide for this. If uh, yeah, there we go. It does. Dear Lord, the political intrigue, the, the Viva La Revolution, the concept of uh, children becoming politically aware of their own power and their lack there of it. Uh, I think as an adult, I resonate with all of the characters at, at some point in this book. Uh, and I think that the, I, I think that this probably hits a lot harder 
now than it might have a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it definitely resonated more with me now than when I read it when it first came out. And I do think it's partially, I mean, it's partially because I'm older, but it's also partially because of the current political climate, right? Like, um, I think in a post-2016 world, this resonates in a different way than it would have in a pre-2016 world, right? So, um, yes, 100%. I do recommend if anybody, even if you have read it, like, it's a good reread. It's a good reread right now. And it does, it's not, and it won't take you long because this is YA. It won't take you long. And it's very satisfying. No, I think we're so used to novels being like, at least I am being over like 400 to 700 yeah. pages. This caps out at 350. Yeah, like, it's this really is, easy. This is, a, this is daytime read. Yeah, it's really easy. Really easy. It's good. All right. All right. Where can you find us? All right, guys. So here's what you can expect. Um, So after uh, we say goodbye to Landon, we're going to play some more of our Sims 2 Legacy um, also next week on Interstage Window, we are going to be doing our Mockingjay follow-up episode. It's going to be so fun. Okay. So here's what it is. You guys get this. You guys get the inside scoop, the spoiler. Okay. We're, we are taking main characters of 20, 2000 to 2015, uh, fandom, and we are putting them in a Hunger Games. So come next week to write a games for us. We've got a, a beautiful cast of characters, lots of fun ones. Um, we'll take bets on who we think is going to win, uh, who's going to actually make it past the cornucopia. All of that stuff is going to be so super fun. So that's what we're doing next week. Um, Tomorrow on Artistic License, I'm going to be doing the finale of Mist 3 Exile. Uh, we couldn't do it last week because I was sick. So we're going to do it tomorrow, you guys. So if you watch the first um, the first episode, the first part of that, it's in it's in three different episodes on my YouTube channel. Um, and then we're going to do the, the we're going to do the final two areas uh, tomorrow. So that's like what you can expect on the stream. Uh, here's yeah, it's going to be so super fun. Here's all of my socials. So that's like where you can find me. Um, again, if the, we're having my birthday on the 22nd, so if you'd like to get me a gift for opening that, you want to do that on my throne wish list. So here's all of the different ways to support me, but you can find the throne wish list for that. That's really like the funnest thing right now. So that's where you can find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Land in Maine. It's a pun. Uh, and there I post some fun insights into what I'm doing and some writing expert excerpts. Uh, your girl is working on her novel this summer, so it's I'm sure there will be a lot of like word updates and craziness that I'm doing. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. Are you so are you gonna be working this novel into like um into like some NaNoWriMo goals when that comes around? Uh probably not, but no. uh I hope to have the entire manuscript finished uh by September. So what? Let's, we're gonna, okay. we're, we're, we're gonna see we're gonna see if that happens we're gonna try to hold you to it all right landon yeah i uh it. i started it this week and i was just like editing the first few chapters that i had already written like a year ago and then i was like oh, i'm just gonna have to fucking rewrite all these so i started that's what it always happens scratch. that's what always happens with <laughs> editing is you really just need to start over and rewrite it so yeah i totally agree all right, you guys. So what we're going to do now is um, say say goodbye to the YouTube video recording. So we're going to pause, stop the recording here. If you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget to like and comment down below and subscribe if you liked it. And um, we will we will see you. We will see you next week. So, of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. Bye. Bye.